and the password is incentive 16. Okay. Okay, so everyone's here. Um, so um, I'm an associate fellow here with the Global Economy and Finance uh, Department. Um, I was involved uh, in the W20 setting up initiative when the Turkish presidency uh, started, started it following the great in initiative um, by the Australian presidency the year before, uh, setting this target of reducing the uh, labor force participation gap uh, for women by 25% by 2025. So we're almost halfway through that. Um, and um, we have here a, a, a great uh, lineup of speakers to kick off, um, kick off reviewing how far we've got, to st and starting with Yuriko Meguro, who's uh, co-chair of the W20 in Japan, who will summarize the progress this year. Uh, she will be followed by Salma Al-Rashid, who's the head of the delegation for uh, the W20 for Saudi Arabia, who will uh, take on the G20 presidency next year, and she will highlight their key objectives for 2020. Um, then comes David Bell, who is the director of standards policy at British Standards Institute, to tell us how uh, some, of, some of our uh, aims in the uh, W20 are becoming hardwired into practical implementation uh, matters on the ground. Um, and last but not least is Bernice Lee, who's uh, head of the global economy and finance team here at Chatham House, uh, who will provide a summary and overview of, of um, the, 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 um, the, the goals of W20. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Yoriko Meguro. Uh, I have been a uh, W20 uh, co-chair in the past um, eight months or so. Um, uh, and uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to share our thoughts. Um, now, in terms of uh, progress made this year, it's very hard to identify, but I would like to uh, begin with the uh, progress made or the impact to the Japanese people and Japan as a whole. Um, uh, what, this is about the positive impact that we have to think about. Uh, in terms of the advocacy, because W20 was not known, I can say, whatsoever. And uh, of course, the people knew about G20, but uh, we didn't know anything about the engagement, engagement groups the existence of it was something very new. So the advocacy on the W20 was very important. So um, even the people who have been engaged with uh, development or the foreign um, assistance didn't know about it. So that was the beginning. And particularly the media people did not know anything about the engagement groups. And so that was a very hard start. Uh, now, uh, developing management skills and setting focus goals to achieve at the steering committee of the presidency was a major um, task for the uh, steering committee. We got together for the first time, for some of us, together to work on the same goal. And we had a very different uh, frame of uh, thinking. So it was a very uh, difficult thing, but important thing, to achieve a goal within a limit time. Uh, also, learning communication methodology to understand uh, language of conceptual equivalence. Uh, this is uh, something very uh, difficult but we just skip, skip it without trying to understand really um, mutually the conceptual, uh, the thing is that we uh, are trying to discuss uh, really meaning uh, with the conceptual equivalent. So this was the, uh, the task for uh, between the, the 
the steering committee members, uh, between uh, engagement groups, between business sector and development sectors. So we all had to learn, and I hope that many people realize that we had to learn. Um, approaching the media was another uh, difficulty, but you can do it if you try and take time. And we learned that. So um, uh, when I compare the eight months uh, before and now, I can see some progress uh, in our mentality. Um, very from beginning from very low to the improved level. Uh, there is certainly I can identify some progress made, but not well enough to have hope for the future. Um, another thing is about the convergence of fact-based uh, knowledge between uh, domestic sectors and global sectors. The people who are just concerned about the domestic issues uh, had really no idea about uh, the need to converge with the people with the different thoughts. But this uh, is improving, I think. Um, so uh, as a result, um, people who have become aware of this and have enough knowledge, uh, then uh, they can compare the re reality in Japan with the reality in other parts of the world, not limited to the uh, G20. Um, now, um, there is still a need, a very strong, strong need, um, to continue uh, the penetration of in information um, and the knowledge but we have to change the uh, mentality in the sense that we still need to uh, uh, appreciate the, that we are being actors to move from words and knowledge to action. Uh, the lastly, uh, acute awareness is still needed for digital learning from the fear of being left this is true for all generations. Now, do I have a few minutes more? I think, I think it's that's not. it, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think that's super. Um, you, we've got to move from knowledge to action, I think is a good way of okay. moving on. Salma, would you like to yes. pick up on that? <laughs> uh, th uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mina, and thank you, Yuriko. Uh, I would like to pick up where Yuriko ended. I think it's uh, um, it's really interesting to see how the Japanese experience as being head of delegation for Saudi Arabia in 2018 in Argentina and then 2019 in Japan and hopefully leading in 2020. Um, the W20 or working within the W20 is really important and is a very good chance for us, especially from a country in, like Saudi Arabia, to bring in the international, through that international dialogue, bringing this knowledge back home on a national level and then moving towards a lo local level and, and seeing how the Japanese experience on a local level also, it does give, give us a lot of inspiration and hope for how moving forward in uh, 2020. We hope to, uh, for Saudi in 2020, to pick up where, I mean, actually continue the work that was started in the, during the Turkish pregnant, uh, presidency in 2015 and continue this momentum, especially with the um, great accomplishment of the establishment of the accelerator, the Women 20 Accelerator, and having these two big paragraphs in the Leaders' Declaration. How can we keep this momentum and build on that? So we hope to take the W20 recommendations from previous years, see what has been picked up, how did that develop, and where are still areas that we can continue pushing forward, moving towards more uh, actionable uh, policy recommendations, and really, uh, how can we turn that into a way where all the G20 countries can, with, within their different um, context, take that back home and see how can they 
put that in, in work on the ground. I, I work for a local non-government organization in Saudi that's 57 years old, and we've come a long way in how women from women start only allowed access to education in the 60s and then moving forward to only allowed to drive in 2018, uh, to vote in 2015. I think we've come a long way, but this, there is still so much uh, to be done. Uh, on, when it comes to policy, there has been a lot of changes, but we still need to do a lot on uh, addressing cultural and social barriers. We know there is a, a, my organization is currently working with different government bodies to uh, evaluate the labor laws and see what, what can be done because the government is really serious about increasing women's uh, um, participation in the labor market, but how can we do that? Because you're talking about a country where maybe about three, uh, three or five years ago, women need, needed a male's consent to work. And now that's no longer the case, but how do you change these uh, uh, mindsets? So we hope for 2020, I mean, that's, I'm going very local, but then it's really important to see what's happening on a global level. So global thinking, but taking that global thinking into uh, local action and on, on, on a grassroots level. Um, we're hoping to continue, obviously, the three focus areas of labor inclusion, financial inclusion, and digital inclusion. We're in the final uh, process of selecting our fourth pillar, hopefully, and we'll be announcing it once we take the handover from our Japanese uh, colleagues. Thank you very much. That's excellent. David. Thank you, Mina. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. In particular, I should commend the organizers for putting together such an exciting agenda and yet still finding a slot to talk about standards, um, which on the surface might seem like the dullest part of the next two days. Um, for many of us, standards refer, refer to the fact that the plug fits into the socket or the plumbing underneath our house works because the connectors are all the same size. Very important, but terribly dull. And I hope that in the next uh, two and a half minutes at least, um, I can talk a little bit about how we're trying to, in uh, Eureka's words, to take, go from knowledge to action and really progressing the agenda that we're talking about over the next two days. Let's first of all just consider what a standard is. So these are voluntary tools. They are the definition of best practice. They define and codify what good looks like. And they don't just cover the wiring and the plumbing of your house. They, there's a standard that exists for almost every product that is purchased and used anywhere in the world. They're increasingly now, um, standards are being developed for the services that we, that we use, increasingly for the organization and governance of uh, organization and their management. So standards permeate pretty much every aspect of our daily and uh, commercial uh, life and indeed social progress. And they're produced in a, in a special environment, in an open, multi-stakeholder approach. So it's not just the producers of the product or the service provider that's telling us what good looks like. It's actually the, the, the procurer of that product or service. It's the end user, the consumer, NGOs, government, uh, re other regulators, academics, material scientists. They come, to, come together to agree by consensus what good looks like for a particular product or service or a particular process. And they're global. If you look at in the UK this year, in the last 12 months, we published something like 2,500 new and revised standards. 95% of those standards are international or European in origin. So that's to say we were influencing the content of a standard that was intended to be used right around the world. So a standard is global. It covers almost everything we do, and it's covered in this multi-sector approach. So just imagine the capacity for standards to do harm by reinforcing the status quo. And then just imagine the possibilities of acting as soft power change agents in order to drive forward the agenda that we're talking about today. So one of the ways that we've been putting, as Mina said, uh, something into action this year, uh, we worked on a declaration on gender responsive standards and standards development in the UNECE, the UN Economic Commission for Europe. Two of the architects are in the room today, and I should pay tribute to their their leadership and foresight for coming up with this and recognizing actually that standards um, have, can play this important role. The gender declaration, the Declaration on Gender Responsive Standards and Standards Development, provides standards bodies with a tool to go out and ensure that there is gender, proper gender balance on the committees, on the stakeholder groups that come together to write the standards, and to consider the impact that the standard might have on gender equality issues. 
And I'm pleased to say that there's over 50 standards organisations, including BSI in the UK, that have signed up to this gender declaration in the first two months, which I think is a really a great sign and demonstrates what can be done. So we're committed in the UK to producing a diversity action plan and to really, um, uh, really um, fulfilling the aims that the UNEC had when they came up with the concept because we can imagine where things go wrong and I was pleased and slightly dismayed at lunch to hear of yet more new areas where standards can play a role in, in uh, 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 impacting on women's lives in a negative way. We know already about stories of personal protective equipment where the standard that was written in a room mainly with men uh, is simply not fit for purpose for women. The, the, def the, the size definitions, the, the, the crash test dummies that are used in, in, in automotive industry. Uh, there's so many examples of standards where gender just did not reach the table to be considered. So we've considered all of these different stakeholder groups, but at no point did anybody say what about gender and what about the issues that they could have. BSI is part of ISO, the global uh, network of national standards bodies. ISO is doing a lot of work on gender-specific topics, as well as being a signatory itself to the gender declaration. Topics which um, um, are probably not appropriate to necessarily to be addressed in forums like this, but issues around um, clean cook stoves. There's a UN initiative there. Four million people a year, mainly women and girls, die through uh, poor um, uh, use of cook stoves in the home. Uh, there's a the global trans, uh, task force that the UN has set up. ISO is part of that, looking at the way standards can help to drive cleaner cook stoves and actually help to solve an issue that is by far impacting more women than, than, than men. There's a, there's, a, there's a dozen of these uh, types of issues that are now being addressed more and more by standards. But as I say, it's got the power to reach out into every sector, into every product, into every service that we use. So the, so the possibility that making that switch and ensuring uh, a gender balance in the way they're developed can, can have a massive impact. Thank you. That's super. Kate okay, Bernice, please. Well, <laughs> thank you. Uh, as I was thinking about what to say today, I thought to myself, you know, the, the really tragic thing is that I kind of know what the conclusion would be, that we have made a lot of progress, but it's not enough, that we have lots of knowledge, but it's not really actioned enough, that really for all the work that we try to do, there is still a missing middle. We perhaps focus sometimes too much on the top, woman on board, sometimes too much on the bottom, bottom billion and often forgetting the middle part. So I was thinking to myself, well, if that's the case, then what shall we do? And Yoriko and others also mentioned in Selma to the social cultural barriers. So I thought my first conclusion, therefore, for this panel for me is, well, let's measure what we can and let's be as transparent as possible. And that has to be an important starting point. But that also means that for my second point, I want to build on what David just said. It is ever more important that we develop all these different mechanisms around soft governance. They may seem soft for now, but soft governance are building blocks for harder governance down the line. You gave us some excellent examples, and I was thinking about how we will have two days of discussion on the future of work on digitalization. And we do a lot of work in Asia, and certainly in the case of Asia, because of the trade war and the deglobalization fear more and more companies are rethinking what their supply chains should look like. So this idea that you could find jobs for a low-income uh, woman in light manufacturing perhaps is no longer going to be a possibility for the future if more jobs are going to be outsourced to machines or onshored back at home, or for the matter, thinking through the implications, actually not even a developing country at all down the line. And in this particular case, it cannot be more important that we think through all the different governance challenges that was outlined earlier, but also the standards around which we design machines, the machine learning algorithm, how we decode the machines, etc. And there are many experts in the room, and I think that it is extremely important that we look at the future of work with that lens, but only, not just that lens. We have to look at the future of work with the lens that perhaps there may not be future of work in areas. And one of my favorite dis depressing statistics is the fact that one, one out of five people by 2040 could be living in slums, particularly those emerging economies in Africa and Southeast Asia. And by 2050, we could be talking about one in four. So we're talking about many different rapidly converging trends around deglobalization, around machines and robotics and new manufacturing, and also around rapid urbanization at a time when we're not investing enough in obviously either rural economy or urban population, which brings me to my third point. 
I mean, I, I, my day job actually is mainly on environment and climate change. And you must have heard of recently the whole kind of what I call the plastic madness, which is incredible. So, you know, a couple of documentaries, uh, many different actions have now created a lot of, ex a lot of excitement around plastics and, and things what, that we can do. And I was thinking recently that we could be very, very focused in what we do. <laughs> you know, I work on gender, that's what I do. I work on climate, that's what I do. But what we learned from the plastics example is that young people getting more interested in plastics is a gateway to understanding, for example, emissions from plastic. It is a gateway to understanding the structure around waste management. It is a gateway to understanding how trade really works, that you don't just ship waste somewhere else and let that be taken care of. It is also a way to question structures of decision making as to who makes these decisions around waste management, around production of plastics, use of materials, and whether or not we can create new business models. So <laughs> my last thing, if I may, in my four minutes, I feel that the learning from the plastics example and to some extent what's happening now around mobilization and climate change is that we have to be supportive of all progressive agendas because they do connect to each other and all of them lead us to question and find answers to better, more sustainable, more inclusive, more gender balanced, et cetera, et cetera, production and consumption models. So with that, I would like us to move also more into the gender plus, not just gender itself as, as an agenda item, which I'm sure everyone is already doing but more consciously connecting the agenda in such a way that really make us the bigger than the sum of our parts. That's super, thank you very much. I think we've, we've had some really great introductions and we have 15 minutes for questions. Um, can I see hands? Um, I'm going to take a cluster of them. Um, there's one here, any more? Well, let's start with this one. Could you introduce yourself, please? Yes, no, my name is Arif Zaman. I sit on the board of the Commonwealth Business Women's Network. Um, my question uh, to you, David, I think it's really welcome, very welcome, that the standards um, community is looking at what it can do more in this area. But one of the most, um, I think if I'd use alarming statistics, shocking statistics, that some of the audience will be aware of, is the 1% of contracts that go from government or go from the private sector, 1%, in fact, less than 1% go to women-owned businesses. Now that is a statistic, put it the other way, 99% go to men, 1% yeah? go to women. Now this has been highlighted in various ways at different times, the UN um, Secretary General's High Level Panel, Women's Economic Empowerment, but I think in relation to standards, maybe there's a window here, David, we could consider, and this is, I'm thinking of, and I can't remember the number, but sustainable procurement. So the sustainable procurement standard, which I think came out a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, I think the UK um, from BSI, I don't know whether there's an ISO on that, but I really worry that you know, when my seven-year-old daughter gets to 20, we're not gonna see any movement in this, in this statistic unless we do something different. And that's why my question to you is, is sustainable procurement a lever through which we could look at in this area? Thank you. Thank you, okay. Any other comments, questions before, we, before I take David? Oh, there's one there, right here. So that's one on standards. Uh, thank you all for your introductions to topics which are both very difficult but also interwoven in ways which we are only just beginning to see and I particularly want to pick up on Bernice's point. Um, issues that are across everyone, not just gender-based, but across all types of human beings have a way of penetrating between knowledge and action through emotions. And I think what you picked up, Bernice, about the plastics and the response to the environment, particularly with young people, is an engagement through creating an emotional environment which enables people to move to action. Because, frankly, we all know knowledge is not enough. Try telling a two-year-old why it's a good idea not to have another marshmallow. for example, it's one of the areas where you can be totally cross-subject and, and cross-type of human being. And one of the most telling examples is health, where there's just now been an explosion of interest in the fact that drug tests are unbelievably biased towards <coughs> adult males. 
Do, are you working on this kind of cross-boundary standard, not just in health, but perhaps in other areas, that might actually help the thinking progress? One more here. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, David Stoker from the UK Energy Research Centre. Uh, we recently published a report about uh, gender equality in academia, and we found, um, our research has found cultural issues there with uh, a culture of working very long hours and a volume-based publication uh, quantity model of success. And that really blocks a lot of, in terms of knowledge production uh, for the innovation we need uh, blocks a lot of women from progressing in their careers because part-time is difficult and so on. Uh, I wondered if the panel has any comments about academia and knowledge production, which we need. Okay, well, I think there's... Um, well, okay, I'll take one more over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm Ros Ebden from Plan International. Um, I thought it was interesting that Peter Hill, when he was talking about his experience um, of being a Sherpa to the G20, was saying, recognize the importance of culture and social barriers, but that it was an incredibly difficult thing to discuss at the G20. You yourselves have highlighted just how important it actually is in making progress. So I was just interested to hear what sort of strategy and approach you might be planning to have so that you can make more headway and more impact on that very important issue uh, with the G20 in the future. Thanks. Okay, that's great. So we've got a um, question on standards, which I'd like to take David first, and then um, on interwoven issues. Um, um, and also cultural questions, but and, and perhaps um, Yoriko, you can you can come in, say a few words that you wanted to do, but also take up the cultural question. Um, Salma, would you like to? Yes, right. Yes. Okay. So first, David, because there were quite a lot of things on standard. Okay. Well, thank you, Arid, for the question, and um, just to commend the work that you're doing on the Commonwealth Women Business. Uh, we're connecting that up with the Commonwealth Standards Network, which is a new organisation which is trying to bring together Commonwealth countries to discuss standards and to do uh, technical assistance work specifically aimed at Commonwealth countries. Um, your question about the sustainable procurement standard, absolutely, that's the, exactly the kind of thing that a standard can address. It can talk, not, I, I was really uh, struck by what you said, Benice, about the fact that we need to combine the progressive agendas. And so sustainable procurement should not just be around climate change. It should not just be around, um, it, it should be much broader than that. And it should include issues around gender. Whether it does or not, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't, I'm not familiar with all of our 37,000 standards. But if it's not, that's precisely because of the issues we just spoke about, the fact that, that we, we need to get a broader based, um, uh, particularly on gender, a broader based group in the room in order to make sure those issues are not forgotten. And to get experts, you, um, women on our committees, of whom we have a couple of thousand, tell us in many cases they're not there to be gender, they're not gender experts. They're there because they're experts in uh, is still in metal, they're metallurgists or they are environmental scientists. So, so you need specific skills and we recognize that and that's something that has to be done, I think, as part of the training. On the question around data bias, I think we, we're all familiar with algorithms that are completely biased and um, coding that's completely, bi that, that is biased, um, blind uh, bias in coding. That's something that I think, um, I don't know if there's any particular work on it at the moment, but we're certainly looking at ways a standard can enhance consumer trust in the way data is handled, the way systems are set up, the way um, autonomous systems in particular are programmed. So we've established something called Oceanis, which is an international network of organizations looking at ethical um, uh, coding for artificial intelligence and how you make sure that it picks up ethical issues through at the coding level. So there's no solution for that from our side, but certainly it's a topic that's, that we think a standard could help with at least. Bernice, you want to just come in on that? Yeah, I kind of want to pick up on the, is it emotion? I mean, it is partly emotion point. Um, I, I, I was reflecting after what you said that, is it emotion or is it because they're less encumbered by what we're encumbered by? So in, we, in the way we do our job, we have deadlines, the communicate has to be finished, you have demands from government. I guess younger people hopefully have less constraints and therefore can afford to think longer term sometimes than us. And I was reflecting on what people said when they're 20 and what they do afterwards. And there's always a discrepancy. And perhaps one of, one of the education goals is indeed to 
keep that in mind, notwithstanding the need for specialization, notwithstanding for the need to, base, you know, to get earn our living from our competitive advantage. But in terms of the cultural barrier, the reason why I think that it is important, extremely important to start with measuring and transparency is because those cultural and political barriers, which you're going to talk a lot more about, are very difficult to handle. So recent, in, in one of my jobs the last couple of, you know, last couple of years, um, I found out that a bunch of young women in an organization were taught all the negative stuff. What I mean by that is they were taught that they have a narrower likability spectrum, um, that they need to not wear shiny things on their ears because otherwise men can't focus, you know, wear proper clothes so that no one is being distracted. And I thought to myself, why are we teaching young women that? Why are we not teaching men that lesson? So I think there are quite a lot of things that we do that we perhaps don't think enough through this, this, that, the implication. And these are the kind of cultural barriers that I think is much more day to day that we learn from the building blocks and become hopefully more institutionalized. So um, back to the, I mean, I wish I had a straight question, uh, answer and, and life would be good if we could address social and cultural barriers. We know that these are barriers that are very difficult to, to, to address and it takes time when, even when you, and we see it in Saudi, we cha when policy changes, it takes, it takes years. Historically, we know this everywhere in the world, it takes a long time for it to trickle down. I think back to what the, um, uh, Mr. Hill was, was, men was talking about, I think it's difficult to work, uh, to look at it on a, from a G20 uh, level. We can acknowledge that this is an issue, but then we need to take it to, on a local level. Because every context is very different, and how you deal with it, you need to really understand the, um, the language. And, and, and I mean, even in Saudi, if you go to the central part of Saudi, it's a different conversation than to the south or the north. So I think you really need to understand the context and start in edu early education, start with the the boys and the men, and so you need to start early and through education. But it's not there is no straight uh, answer. Okay, would you like to come in? Um, just to add, um, I, I don't think I can leave here without uh, uh, saying this. Uh, um, it's rep it's uh, related to what uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Hill talked about, it was rather difficult for the end in uh, agreeing on the declaration. And there are certain issues uh, uh, that there are always uh, countries which uh, are against uh, agreeing on. And uh, so I'm going to uh, talk about it. Um, the first one, the number one uh, recommendation we gave them uh, was the 25 by 25. And we insisted, we requested uh, for the uh, ministers to uh, report to uh, openly um, next year. Uh, but the declaration is much stronger than what we requested. The leaders made it clear that, that they would make the progress report every year and uh, with the, the use of the statistical uh, report done by ILO and OECD. And so they would uh, re make reports on facts-based. Uh, um, uh, facts based. And so uh, this uh, was uh, a very, very um, good and satisfying outcome. And also, uh, Mr. Hill, as, as Mr. Hill said, some countries do not want to use the word gender. And also, some people, uh, some uh, countries do not want to be monitored and evaluated. And we put them both consistent, consistently. And uh, so it was really a great success that we had that uh, um, paragraph. I also personally, I uh, was very happy but surprised to go to women's participation in the labor market in an ind independent one full sentence, not as a part of the gender issue listing. And this was really worth su being surprised, but there is much hope. Uh, because if, we, if once we agree on this, then we can keep making this a fact 
And so I think what we can have a hope. I hope I'm, I'm not too uh, pessimistic. And so the following line also contain our kind of language, um, such as gender pay gaps and all forms of discrimination against women and combat stereotypes in that way. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I will have time for a few more. Yes, one here. Two, three. Thank you. I'm Ken Bluestone. I work with Age International. I just wanted to reflect on a particular bias that obscures the contributions and roles that older women um, make to society. And Japan has been no things happening everywhere in the world, and particularly that aging is gendered, so that women are outliving men everywhere in the world. Yet, what we're seeing consistently is that the way that older women are represented is not actually as active contributors to society, but actually as recipients, as dependent, as requiring care. And this came through in the UN Women's Progress Report, where it does not acknowledge the economic contribution. So I'm just curious from both, this is a question for Salma and for Yoriko, for the G20, um, what are the opportunities for helping to reframe um, the recognition of the economic contributions older women make? That's very good. That's a very good one. I think we definitely would like to. Please, yes. Not. Can you, is it here? Uh, this is not so much a question, but can a little. You identify yourself. All right. I'm uh, Sir Huang Poon uh, from Manchester University. I'm a professor, and um, I, this, as I say, is not a question, but to share some research finding, uh, very much uh, coincide with your observations about cross issues. So we have preliminary research uh, about genders and also a lot of uh, ESG, CSR aspects using database such as uh, MSCI, KLD, and also using rat race. Rat race also have a lot of uh, news count on all the different uh, aspects. So it's very interesting that uh, we have a lot of women um, she, you know, like uh, directors, also top senior management percentage. So it's uh, very consistently, of course, um, I want to declare that we still need to do a lot of causality test. But women, uh, in general, statistically, we can show, uh, of course, no causality proven yet, that uh, they are very uh, highly related to uh, less ill finding. So if there's a lot of weakness and negative score, uh, very, very consistently when you have high percentage of women management, women CEO, the very bad significant score uh, drastically reduced. So that is one way. The strength section, uh, difficult to find. So in terms of news count all over the world, and then the news count in like bribery, child labor, uh, controversial business practice. So we have uh, women CEO and also male CEO. Again, um, I'm not trying to fudge the statistic to find the score, but it was kind of uh, common sense and yet striking. Uh, so we have a group of women CEO and a group of uh, men CEO. So we look for the worst count. The worst count among the men CEO is about 20 to 30 times the score on the left hand side. This is just a research finding. So this is very much coincide to what you are saying about cross-sectional issue. So somehow uh, I have other colleagues talking about other diversities, you know, like uh, disability, uh, cross-culture. I think the point is that diversity, you bring in some new thought, a different thought, a little bit of balanced thought about other things. And perhaps this is uh, how uh, in my works uh, echo what you just said about looking at all the issues together and how gender can make an impact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, there's one there. A very quick question. My name is Helen Walby. I'm from the Alliance for Financial Inclusion based in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, this is a question for David. Uh, with the work that Basel are doing, do you think it's now about time that there was a global standard for financial inclusion? Standard for financial inclusion. OK, that's a quite tough one. There's one here. 
My name is um, Stephanie, and I work in diversity and inclusion. My question is for Bernice Lee. So you mentioned about you know breaking silos and seeing the progressive agendas all together. Um, I'd like to know how, or your perspective on including the private sector, because there's a lot around policy and what governments can do, but we know particularly large companies are taking the lead or can move sometimes even broader agendas than government. So how, how do you suggest that they come into, into play? Okay. There is this new uh, thing that's been formed over the past year called Endeavor, which is precisely to pick up on private sector. Um, um, would, would anybody like to perhaps come in on that? I mean, oh, well, so I've got um, a, a really excellent question on elder, uh, older women um, and how they're portrayed almost as, as sort of dependents and, and so on, rather than looking at their contribution to society. And, um, and then there's uh, stuff on, something on unpaid care work, um, that, which you highlighted, um, the fact that um, leaders have committed themselves to address unpaid care work. And it does seem to me like this is something that perhaps we need to focus on as a, as a campaign more. Um, because the, the, the G20 is this kind of, you know, finance ministers meet, central bankers meet, and so on. And addressing unpaid care work, um, addressing child care requires fiscal policy. And um, perhaps that's, some, that's, a sort of, that's something that we need to highlight a lot more um, in, in our work. Um, because without that, you know, we're, we're sort of back to, we're sort of, fighting a, a sort of a bit of a losing battle. What a fantastic study that is, and it also, uh, it also chimes with the work that we've been doing around more diverse groups writing standards, and we found that not only are gender issues picked up, but actually the outcomes of that group is much better. It's a much richer debate, and you get a much richer set of outcomes. So I think that's just, uh, you, you, I think you're, you're pushing at that one as well. On the issue of financial inclusion, we'd be really interested in looking to see if that's possible. Um, all of the standards that we talk about, we, we've got lots in the financial sector from simple financial products to help people who are trying to get the work their way through the myriad of different financial products to sustainable finance are all driven by stakeholders. So if there's a stakeholder group that is interested in financial inclusion as a topic, we'd be in interested in looking at it um, in to see if we could get enough people interested to write a standard. And as many of the standards that we've spoken about today, lots of them do start in the UK and then become global. So an issue like financial inclusion is clearly not a UK only issue. So we would love to be a champion of that internationally as well. But I'm uh, happy to talk to you about it separately, but I think we, we need a stakeholder to, to drive it forward. We're happy to consider it though. Okay, Bernice. Um, on, <laughs> I also love the Manchester University correlation that you found. So look forward to understanding more how you analyze the causation as well. But also perhaps this is a time to bring back intuition into our rational thinking. Um, on the question of unpaid care work, but also the silver economy, especially that relates to women. I mean, I hope very much that next year, Selma and others, and, and Yoriko continuing, to be able to factor that in as obviously underutilized economic contribution. So that would be a very obvious way to talk about how we can, perhaps especially in rural areas and many parts of the world, that could be a major factor. On the question about the private sector, it's clearly very important. Obviously, private sector is a part of society, and therefore what they do really matters. But on a very, very senior level, I've kind of noted that the number of CEO females, CEO female CEOs at the Fortune 500 level has actually gone down in the last couple of years. And I don't know where they came back up. I didn't check this morning. So I think that there is definitely a case to be made for more, more, more visibility of those that are still around. But on all that, I mean, you know, this is his job, really. You guys can certify a company whether or not they are doing, you know, or you, you can work with others who certify those, whether they've achieved different types of gender equality at all different levels, pay equality, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that there's a lot that could be done on the standards level that actually really can bring this to light in a much quicker way. And the question would be whether or not you apply different standards to SMEs and others that some have asked for in the past. Mm -hmm. And that would be a tough one to figure out. How do you progress it, graduate it, and actually end up having a system that is simple for us, but nonetheless, every single company know what they need to do. 
Thank you very much. Salma, I, I see you're scribbling. Would you, would you like to have the last word? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mina. I actually, it's, it's really um, interesting to hear all these questions and res uh, responses. And as you mentioned, uh, Bernice, we, we do, I, I personally do look forward to attending the, the other panels today and tomorrow to really take all this uh, um, output and um, use it as a, as a kind of uh, to feed into what we look for to um, a kind of um, frame what we will focus on for next year. Uh, we do recognize that this, uh, as you mentioned, the a this aging issue is not only in Japan, but it, it is people are living longer and mostly women. Uh, but also for a country like Saudi or maybe the Middle East in general, we have a, a surge of youth, unemployed, but then you have uh, older people who are being pushed into early, early retirement, but at the same time have a wealth of knowledge. So how can we kind of work around that? So I'll be uh, happy to continue this discussion further. Thank you. Well, I think we should give our panelists a hand. And we've got our next speaker ready.